our May installment of our Learning Our Landscape presentation series. Uh, and today's gonna be a very interesting talk that I'm very excited for. Um, I'm so excited to welcome Bob Steelquist today. Uh, Bob's a naturalist and a photographer and an author who's lived in Blinn since 1978. Uh, in 2014, he retired from NOAA as Education and Outreach Coordinator for the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, and I highly recommend for those of you um, who haven't read it, his book, The Northwest Coastal Explorer, uh, is a great sort of naturalist guide to uh, our local landscape. So um, I would ask, as always, uh, please save your questions for the end or feel free to type them in the chat box. And at the end, we'll, uh, we'll try and get through as many of those as possible. So without further ado, uh, welcome, Bob. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you. Uh, and uh, every, uh, can you hear me OK, David? Loud and clear. OK, great. Well, I'd, I'd, be, I'd like to begin today by, uh, by acknowledging that I live in the traditional territory of the Sklalem people. Uh, I also live in the midst of a vibrant uh, community uh, that we all share. Uh, uh, and uh, the Jamestown Sklalem tribe is very, very central to the well-being that we all experience here, quality of our environment. And, uh, and most recently, you know, our, our health. So I would like to thank, um, uh, I'd like to thank the tribe for their, their part in shaping me and in shaping our community and, uh, and the opportunity to present today. I'm gonna go ahead and, and switch over to uh, open, the, uh, open the PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk today about Gary Oak restoration, uh, particularly uh, focusing on work that's being done in the Salish Sea region. And uh, it'll highlight uh, work that's been done in SQUIM and look at some of the work that's being done elsewhere. And really importantly, uh, I want to move into the idea of um, Gary Oak in, in time, its past, uh, the present, and the future. Um, to start with, uh, we're just gonna do a really quick overview of Gary Oaks and, uh, and some of their natural history, their range and distribution uh, that, that we see today, but also from, uh, from uh, the accounts of the botanists that entered the region with the uh, settlement days. The overall geographic range of Gary Oak extends from somewhere near Nanaimo, a little north of Nanaimo on the uh, Vancouver Island coast, all the way down into uh, Sacramento Delta, Salinas uh, uh, area. And then uh, there were populations over in the high Chaparral and the Sierra foothills uh, on the east side of the San Joaquin Valley. The, uh, the broadest and the, the major extent of Gary Oak uh, the population is in the Willamette Valley of Oregon and, the, and then the Southern Oregon uh, mixed range is there, the Umpqua down into uh, the Rogue Valley. Uh, we see Gary Oaks coming up through the Cowlitz uh, River Basin and into Nisqually uh, and then uh, original Gary Oak habitat extended up along uh, both sides of the uh, Olympic Peninsula. We have existing stands near Shelton uh, and then San Juan Islands. Uh, so this is a, a, a very, very generalized view of the geographic range. What we have to understand is the Gary Oaks themselves uh, exist in small pockets of refugia that within that area of suitability uh, retain qualities of soil and sunlight and temperature and, uh, and uh, exposure, especially to sunlight, uh, that, that are conducive to their growth. We're gonna talk a little bit about how they've uh, weathered over time from deep time in, into the present. Gary Oak is familiar to us with its uh, checkerboard kind of bark, deep fissures that uh, home to a lot of organisms, insects, and then of course the classic oak leaf. It's, a, it's part of the white oak group of oaks uh, and so uh, white oaks are some of the uh, largest 
uh, largest oaks uh, in existence in Europe and in the Eastern US. And our oaks uh, tend to get to a very large size uh, in some places and in many places remain fairly small. Uh, acorns are the seed that's produced. Uh, we call it uh, a crop of acorns, the mast. And uh, Gary Oaks will, uh, uh, they'll lay out uh, massive crops of mast on irregular intervals. Uh, one is a way of kind of swamping the, uh, the, the, the organisms that consume the, the uh, acorns, which are very high in nutrition. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, in a later section about what we look for in acorns when we're gonna use them for planting. But acorns have uh, produced phenomenal amounts of nutrition for all kinds of critters. Uh, in, in deep soils, Gary Oak uh, uh, takes on this characteristic of this broad, broad, broad uh, umbrella, beautiful, beautiful rounded form, uh, mainly because of, of prairie conditions where the trees are growing. They have access to sunlight in all directions. And so these big spectacular uh, Gary Oaks uh, through the Willamette Valley, and through uh, some of the prairie uh, valleys of Western Washington are, are they're really, the oaks form a really important component of the landscape from a visual standpoint. We also see in some places where they've been integrated into an agricultural landscape in that they don't take up that much space, but they offer a, a aesthetic relief. And in many cases, uh, the original farmers that were clearing these fields for cultivation would move rocks into piles at the base of the oaks. But, uh, uh, and then we also see in a lot of places where there's great Gary or Bob, I just lost your audio. I don't know if anybody hey, else did. Am I back on? Yeah, now you're back. Okay. Uh, how far back did we go? Just a couple seconds. Okay, we're good then. Uh, so uh, cattle would often use the shade and there was no problem with that unless there was too much impact of the soils or compaction rubbing against the trees, uh, losing the bark. If you look at the tree on the right, you realize it's a younger offshoot of what was a much older tree that was, uh, uh, that was there uh, in the past at some point. Uh, we also see Gary Oaks in closed stands. Uh, we call these closed canopy stands, uh, often in deep soil areas where the trees are very crowded together and they basically form a, a fairly thick forest. Uh, this is fairly young forest, but it's growing into being one of those closed canopy forests. And then on the east side of the Cascades, uh, we see Gary Oak uh, in the Columbia Gorge and through the uh, Klickitat country into Yakima country. We see it in this, in this stunted form. It's the same species, but here it's trying to eke out its existence uh, sitting on top of Columbia uh, basalts. So there's very thin soil there. The oak is successful there because it throws down very, very deep roots. And in the basalts, particularly the Columbia uh, basalt flows of Eastern Washington, Oregon, uh, those, those rocks are easily fractured and there's uh, resources, water, soil down in there. Uh, this is a uh, photograph taken on the, uh, near Rowena uh, on the, uh, in the Columbia Gorge. Oaks are also known for their association with prairies and uh, prairies uh, throughout uh, uh, the Northwest have often been likened to a Mediterranean uh, kind of climate that we have here, uh, but mostly deep soils uh, and, and open areas. And so prairies are common through or were common through the Lamont Valley. Uh, they were common up through the Cowlitz, Nisqually country, uh, prairies, uh, small prairies uh, near uh, Shelton. Uh, and there are quite a few prairies on the Olympic Peninsula uh, out as far as the coast. Uh, this is the golden paintbrush, which is one of the rarest of uh, the prairie plants that we have. And uh, uh, golden paintbrush is endemic. It's only known uh, to 
uh, occur naturally in five or six locations in our area, in the Puget Sound area. Uh, this is a particular plant that I photographed at the Glacial Heritage Preserve in Thurston County. We also see camas in, in oak associated prairies, uh, camas in usually with moisture, uh, moisture conditions and growing in, in open areas. Uh, camas is, uh, was an incredibly important starch plant uh, in, in uh, pre-contact times uh, before uh, alternatives like potatoes became available to native people. Uh, and we still see camas blooming naturally in, in many uh, prairie relics throughout the uh, Puget Sound area, extending way up into Canada. And then uh, this is another uh, photograph from the Glacial Heritage Preserve outside of, outside of Olympia. And camas is really important uh, uh, and all prairie forbs are important uh, for pollinating uh, pollinating populations of insects. It's very hard to overstate the importance of Gary Oak ecosystems uh, to wildlife. And we're gonna to touch on this uh, uh, in much greater detail later on. But I'd like, to, I'd like to read the first quote. It's possible that acorns influence more wildlife species than any other single kind of natural food. Uh, acorns are, are very, very nutritious and they're used by uh, mammals, they're used by birds, uh, uh, they're used by insects. Uh, they're really an important source of food. In addition, oaks provide uh, cavities for nesting and their upper foliage is really important for migrating neotropical songbirds. And then the shrub and ground cover habitats are important for insects and for, uh, for birds who are ground nesters and, and inhabit the, the, the middle and lower canopies. Uh, oak are really important for breeding birds and, and generally speaking over 200 uh, vertebrates and I like the word profusion uh, uh, are important in, in oak woodlands. This just speaks to the profound value that these have as perhaps one of the greatest habitats of biodiversity that we have in, in the terrestrial areas that we know. And here we see locally recently, uh, looks like a pine siskin feeding up in the canopy of, a, of an oak. So once the vernation occurs, that is the leaves start to pop out and the flowers, uh, oak trees just become host to uh, many, many types of invertebrates and insects. And uh, between the pine siskins and uh, passing or the, the migrating warblers and other songbirds, these are really, important. And then we see in the open prairies, uh, we see rare, rare birds in our area. This is a, a western kingbird uh, that really likes it, thrives in these open prairie environments. We also begin to see mountain bluebirds and western bluebirds that like the openness of, of the oak, uh, the oak uh, associated prairie. This is one of my favorite shots because it combines two of my favorite uh, organisms. Uh, the oaks in the background are located, this is on Savi Island at the confluence of the Willamette and Columbia Rivers. This is a uh, wintering habitat for sandhill cranes that migrate up into the central BC coast for breeding. Uh, before we supplemented the food uh, for uh, cranes by growing grains like corn and, and wheat, in the earliest days before cultivation, oaks provided a, a, a very high percentage of the wintering food sources for sandhill cranes, extending into the Sacramento Valley and San Joaquin Valleys, all the way up into uh, the Willamette Valley and, and the Columbia, the Clum Lower Columbia Valley. So uh, before, before we had subsidized wildlife programs of growing sharecropping grains to sustain crane populations through the winter, they depend uh, a lot on oaks. And then we see too that even in our, in our fledgling 
uh, oak plantation in Square, and we see utilization already by uh, by birds uh, finding uh, finding places for shelter within the uh, the branches of these young oaks. In addition to birds and mammals, uh, a lot of insects uh, utilize oak forests. This is the gall wasp in, uh, in, in our squim plantation. The wasps uh, basically burrow into the branch. The branch uh, throws up a defensive mechanism of growing tissue around it that encloses the wasp and becomes these little, uh, these little nurseries. And eventually the wasp will emerge uh, so it's not uncommon to see birds picking around uh, when looking for uh, the wasps to, to emerge out of these. The oak woodlands uh, are also, uh, they have a lot of shrub uh, understory associates. Uh, one of the most common here is the snowberry, uh, which grows into a really dense thicket. What's important about these understory shrubs is that uh, they tend to have a lot of loose leaf litter in them and the, the, the soils are relatively uh, uncompacted uh, so that uh, uh, acorns can fall down into the leaf litter and be hidden there so that they can actually germinate and, and we can see uh, reproduction within these shrub communities. Other shrub associates include uh, bald hip or sometimes nutka rose, uh, that forms in, in thickets up to about five or six feet high. Uh, tall Oregon grape is a very common oak shrub community associate uh, and um, uh, growing in semi-open areas and sh in shrubby areas where there's a lot of light, unlike some of the uh, Oregon grapes that we see in the deeper forest. And then of course the service berry, which uh, is, uh, is a major component of the, of the oak shrub understory complex. So what's left of that, uh, that range that we saw, that area of suitability uh, of, the, uh, of, of oak communities within our region? Sadly, uh, only three to 5% remains uh, based on what we know of early surveys, uh, and what we know of the urbanization that's occurred and the agricultural development that's occurred on, on, on landscapes that oaks used to inhabit. Uh, here's a good example furnished by uh, uh, the Gary Oak uh, Ecosystem Restoration Team in British Columbia. Green represents oak forests as they were surveyed by early Hudson Bay. Uh, as Hudson Bay was uh, setting up shop in 1800. And the red represents oak populations that exist today in, uh, in Victoria. So even though we think uh, that of, of the oaks in Victoria vicinity as being you know, a dominant tree that we see in neighborhoods, we see it in parks, we see it, uh, Beacon Hill Park's a great, great place to go see oaks. Uh, this is but a fraction of what used to occupy that landscape. So similarly, elsewhere, uh, we've had the same situation. I'd like to talk a little bit now about, about moving into a restoration phase and, and, and what we're doing about oaks in terms of regaining some ground with them. Well, first of all, this is the Squim Prairie. The landscape that was flat and open uh, was very, very, uh, very, very easy to till, to cultivate, to turn into crops of pasturage and grains. Uh, and uh, what if 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 you can see where my cursor is? Uh, there's some oaks in the background, and that's in uh, Pioneer Park. And then if you look even further back up toward the, the foothills of the Dungeness, you see that there's a, a kind of a broad trough that runs diagonally from upper right into the lower left on this picture. And that's an, a proto Dungeness floodplain. So the Squim Prairie really occupied what was a paleo version of the Dungeness floodplain. Uh, lower Bell Creek, 
uh, it occupies the, the lower part of that watershed. But at one time, this was the riparian corridor that the dungeon has traveled through, laid down soils, meandered uh, back and forth, and created this prairie. And as we know from archaeological work that was done at the time of the Squim Bypass, this prairie was a, a major production ground and uh, for, for meat, basically. Uh, elk thrived on this grand prairie. And, and the people that lived here, uh, the, the ancestors, uh, took advantage of that prairie. Oaks were scattered throughout that area as well. And we still see some of these early oaks, these large oaks, these savanniform oaks uh, within, within the town. Uh, they took, they didn't take up much space and they had scenic value. So um, uh, they've persisted in this landscape, but we can tell by the two on the right, their round kind of balloon-like form uh, tells us that they were there when there was a prairie there, when it was open grasses. Uh, the little cluster on the right is in Pioneer Park, representing a, a, a little close form, uh, a closed form oak grove. Uh, and that grove is only perhaps at most a couple of hundred years old. And then we see on these terraces between the, uh, the lower floodplain areas of the old Dungeness, we see the terraces, so Metzger Road, uh, we see it along Brown Road. Uh, and these are the places where young trees have had success in the past 50 or 60 years. Uh, these are marginal lands. You can't build a house on one of on one of these uh, slope faces. Uh, these are places where wildlife would find refuge. Say jays would flock into the the the, the uh, understory and plant these acorns. Uh, one of the things that's really important is these slope faces that uh, face to the south. Actually, because of uh, the way the sunlight strikes them, they really reflect a a uh, uh, um, a sunlight regime that would be equivalent to hundreds of miles south latitude of where we are. So these slope faces capture the sun and really hold on to those drier characteristics uh, much better than any of the strictly flat plain surfaces that we see elsewhere in, in the Squim Valley. Okay, uh, Mia Culpa in 1983 as a student at the Evergreen State College, I, uh, I did a study because I was curious. Uh, what's going on with squim oak trees? Why are we just seeing these older trees? How many are there? And what are the, importantly, what are the age classes of these trees? Uh, I did a series of plots and surveys and, and my conclusions are, are typed at the bottom. We have an advanced age population headed toward death and little or no recruitment. Uh, it sounds like a population that will be around for a while, but at some point in the future uh, will suddenly collapse because of a variety of factors. The natural uh, mortality of the oaks, uh, development uh, of uh, diseases, uh, land use changes, and so on. This, uh, this was kind of disturbing to me. Uh, however, it took me about 20 years to do something about it. And it turned out that uh, uh, in 2000, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife acquired uh, parts of the Blake property north of Cary Blake Park. And uh, as part of a larger campaign to buy up sections of the lower Bell, Bell Creek watershed as wetlands, uh, one of the things that was of interest to the department at the time, as related by Anita McMillan, who was uh, important in that process, was that there were existing oak trees on the slope above the hill, and there was a, a broad pasture below and we, uh, we thought about it and thought, uh, why not pitch the idea of an oak woodland? Same time, uh, Bill, Mr. Bill Wood had uh, taken a strong interest in Gary Oaks. He, he weighed in as well. And uh, we formed kind of a trio of, of oak advocates and 
proposed this land use for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife property with a, with a lot of cooperation and support from Sarah Blake, the owner of the, the, the resident, the previous owner of the pasture and, and current owner of the residence. So in 2001, the concept plan was approved and we began collecting acorns. Uh, this is a Google Earth uh, oblique view of the property. Um, Cary Blake Park is, would be right below us. We're looking at the water reuse uh, plant and the soccer fields. So it's this uh, flat old pasture uh, that butts up against that uh, uh, slope. And that slope has a substantial number of oak trees growing on it, uh, mixed in with uh, conifers for, uh, forest. Uh, and if you uh, were to extend off to the left, uh, that, that slope extends behind some neighborhoods up toward Bound Road. And then way off in the distance in the upper right, uh, we would see uh, the Grace Marsh property, Holland Road making that little corner back in there. So this, this property became our, uh, our, our test ground where we were gonna uh, restore oaks. We collected about, 3,500 acorns and put them in pots and uh, watch them grow for a couple of years. This is what uh, this is what the hillside in the back looked like, uh, looks like today, and it hasn't changed very much. So in 2003, uh, we enlisted a group of volunteers and started digging holes and, uh, and cutting back on the turf, uh, going through these pasture grasses to rocky soil below. And uh, uh, we collected acorns, uh, all from the Squim Dungeness Valley, uh, looking for very ripe, uh, plump acorns, large ones with a nice waxy finish on them uh, as they ripen and fall from the trees uh, in October. Uh, we collected the, the seeds and we got them into gallon pots and into tree, uh, tree tubes and grew them out for a couple of years uh, before planting. Uh, when it came time for planting, there were some individuals that really stood out. Sarah Blake in the uh, upper left was more than enthusiastic to uh, have new neighbors in the form of almost 3,000 trees. Uh, just below her in the lower uh, left is Anita McMillan, who spearheaded this through the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Kathy Smith in the upper right volunteer extraordinaire for just about everything important that's happened in our, in our area. And then Bill Wood, who uh, had a very strong personal interest in seeing Oaks restored and uh, uh, has become the operations manager of this whole uh, volunteer operation for all these, all these decades since these trees went in the ground. These are people that were really important to the work that, uh, that happened uh, those days and continues to happen today. So a team of volunteers came out enthusiastically working with us to plant and mulch. Uh, work went on for several weeks and uh, finally we got a bunch of trees in the ground, mulched with the, with the uh, tree protector to keep uh, prevent voles from chewing away and nibbling the little seedlings and eventually uh, uh, deer protectors. Uh, the picture on the left really shows that there were two ways we had the trees, again, pots, which you got to be careful of because the trees send such prodigious uh, taproots down that they'll become root bound, and then more traditional tree tubes. And this is what our, uh, our plantings look like uh, in, the, in the very beginning. Fast forward to 2022, and here's where we are today. Uh, because of deer predation and earlier elk predation, uh, uh, Bill Wood devised this scheme of protectors using a mesh often used for shellfish bags and, and common electrical conduit. Uh, we still have tree protectors around most of them. And now we're, we're beginning to see trees growing, outgrowing the, tree, uh, the, the nets and uh, recent efforts this last year following uh, kind of the, uh, the availability of volunteers. Uh, recently volunteers led 
by Bill, uh, cleared away some of the nets on trees that have exceeded the forage height of deer and opening the tops for uh, yet younger ones to sprout out of uh, eventually. And then we're also seeing on the hillside above natural reproduction in these areas. So uh, like the trees down in the field, these trees get protection uh, to, uh, because they're, they're deer uh, that, that move through that area and, and browse uh, pretty heavily. And finally, the, the other technique that we've used or has been used in that area has been to uh, uh, cut away or kill conifers that are shading some of the more mature trees on the existing uh, community on the hillside. Uh, we achieved this, uh, and this is a typical uh, process for conifer release, as it's called, is to girdle the trees. And because this is land intended for wildlife habitat, girdling the trees kills the, the conifers. And, uh, and then uh, those snags become perches for raptors and, and, uh, and uh, uh, cavity nesters uh, find use in the, as the trees decompose. Spreading out our perspective a little bit, this is, this is a, a representation of current uh, restoration efforts going on in Salishi area. Uh, it doesn't, it's light on the work being done in Victoria proper and Vancouver Island, but it reflects the real intensive work being done in the Chehalis Basin, uh, South Thurston County, uh, where uh, uh, Oak, Oak uh, communities uh, thrive and oak prairies thrive, including some of the largest prairies we know, the Mima, Mima pr uh, prairies and uh, the area encompassed in glacial heritage. But all the way up through into the Fort Lewis area, Fort Lewis has the largest complex of native prairies uh, in existence. Uh, and uh, so the Army has been very active in working with ecologists and, and oak restoration organizations and prairie organizations. Unfortunately, we, most of us can't get out there to visit it. But uh, uh, there have been restoration activities on Whidbey Island uh, at, uh, in, near Coopville. Uh, on the Smith Prairie, there are uh, restoration activities and small population here in Squim. Then all through the San Juan Islands, uh, we've got oak populations and oak restoration projects occurring on Orcas Island and San Juan Island. Uh, so we've got a lot of people working on this. And uh, here's an example, Smith Prairie, uh, where Pacific Rim Institute is housed on Whidbey Island, uh, has uh, uh, plantings, uh, but it, it's also a native prairie that has never really been disturbed. Uh, an example of its pristine quality is, is the persistence of this golden paintbrush. Uh, what's interesting about this piece of property, it was formerly uh, a, uh, the Washington Department of Game pheasant ranch, where they would uh, hatch and rear pheasants for distribution of hunting sites around the state. So under the uh, watchful eye of uh, the game department back in the, those days, uh, this, this uh, ground was preserved and, uh, and never really developed or cultivated. Other areas are uh, in the Mima Prairie, uh, uh, which is uh, a natural area of significance managed by DNR, Glacial Heritage Preserve uh, by Thurston County. Uh, very, very uh, uh, lush prairie habitats down there with a, a lot of native prairie plants growing on them. Uh, private landowners are doing quite a bit too. This is uh, just one example uh, from Orcas Island uh, where uh, we're encouraged by the San Juan Preservation Trust and the San, San, uh, the San Juan Island uh, Land Bank. Uh, they've done a lot of preservation and restoration work on Turtleback Mountain, and it's rubbed off on a lot of the neighbors down there who are seeing opportunities of restoring oaks on, on their property. This is just a, a partial list of folks in our region that are, uh, are active uh, and operating on oak, uh, oak ecosystem restoration, whether it's prairies or, or oak woodlands. Uh, so 
there's, as you can see, there's a tremendous amount of interest. And in my, uh, in, in my wanderings about, one of the things that I've been known and is that the uh, often case, uh, there's a tremendous fidelity to our local projects and, and little communication uh, among, among our projects. Uh, there are some uh, uh, prairie and oak people who work in uh, the agencies, or in some cases academia, who, who are able to bridge from, from site to site. But we've got all this effort and, uh, and, and little, if any, region-wide region coordination of those efforts. Uh, technology transfer, learning from each other, so on and so forth. So uh, a lot of people are excited and are committed to this, but uh, not a lot of people are really finding ways of pulling together a more comprehensive network. This next section I think is probably the, the most important. It's also gonna be, is fairly highly speculative in a lot of ways because uh, we can't travel in time and we, we have to do the best we can. Uh, I want to go back to this uh, suitability range, this geographic range of Gary Oaks. Um, I like to think about um, what we what remains of Gary Oak habitat as as a memory imprinted on the landscape from a deep, deep, deep past. And let's go back to the deep time, deep climate. Uh, 12,000 years ago, as the glaciers left, uh, left behind a cold, uh, a cold and dry environment. And the forests, the forest colonizers were really lodgepole pine. Uh, it's interesting to me that there is oak pollen in the Manus site near Squim, uh, uh, dating from 13,000 years ago. Uh, it's also interesting to me that that's the first sign of human uh, human presence uh, uh, in the Squim area. But at that time, it was a very, very cold environment and um, forests were just beginning to colonize the recently de deglaciated areas uh, uh, of, of the peninsula. About 10,000 years ago, uh, the climate was moderating. It had become fairly moist. This is the first signs that we see from pollen records uh, of, of hemlock and cedar appearing. Uh, 10,000 and 9,000 years ago, uh, the trend is warming and Douglas fir begins to appear in the pollen records. Uh, 8,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago, oak on a broader scale begins to appear in pollen records. So this is, uh, we're starting into a drier, warmer phase of climate that really peaks in about the year 6,000. And 6,000 is a pretty accurate benchmark because we've got Mazama ash intermixed with these soil horizons. This is called, uh, we think of it as the oak maximum. This is where oaks had spread the furthest in as, as a general ecosystem. Douglas fir begins to, uh, is mixed in with this. Uh, gradually at, uh, after 2,000 years, uh, the modern climate evolves, oaks begin to retreat, hemlock and cedar begin to spread. And it's important uh, culturally because it's with the rise of the cedar forest that we begin to see the, in human culture, the cedar technology taking over of large canoes, large houses. Present time, uh, oak uh, exists in isolated refugia. Now, uh, some people, and I credit Fred Sharp with uh, uh, drawing our attention to this, uh, really look at the oak ecosystem as being uh, spatially uh, similar to places like the Mediterranean. Um, I like to think of the oak ecosystem as, as being a relic of time. And so that the, the oak ecosystem that we know today is a faint echo. It's a small relic of a climate that was warmer and drier around 6,000 years ago. Uh, what, what made these oaks persist here? 
Well, in a lot of cases, uh, in, in the case of Vancouver Island and the Olympic Peninsula, we had the phenomenon of the rain shadow. So we've got microclimates that helped, uh, help, help the oak persist here. In areas like uh, the uh, Vancouver Island with thin soils on bedrock and excessively drained soils of the Squim Dungeness Valley, we have soils that uh, uh, drain very quickly, uh, tend to be a little drier. And so uh, that, that's another factor that helps oaks persist here. And then in, in all these areas up to the present, up until, well, up until settlement times, we had native burning and we had fire on the landscape as a way of managing landscapes. So because of these combinations, uh, some of these areas were privileged to retain uh, the, the microclimates and the communities, the plant communities of that 6,000 year old climate. Ethnobotany's really important here. Uh, I did a North American general search of Quercus, which is the genus of oaks, and found that in ethnobotany database, in the ethnobotany database, there were 786 hits on, on, on ethnobotanical uses. So acorns as food in many of those cases and, and a wide array of preparations. Interestingly enough, acorns as children's toys, I think uh, little tiny tops, uh, acorns as coffee, uh, dried and ground, uh, acorns as currency, being used to pay off uh, uh, at, through ceremony and celebration. Acorns as dye, uh, uh, dye stuff for basketry. Uh, bark as medicine. Sticks with incredible durability using as uh, diggers for camas. Uh, interestingly enough too, a wood being used in combs. And then, of course, the firewood gathered uh, in, uh, in, in, oak, in oak forests. Uh, another really interesting component of ethnobotany is from the work of Ron Taylor, who was a botanist at Western Washington University. 1975, he published a piece where he began to correlate oak populations to known uh, village sites. Now, granted, this is a very large scale map, and it can only really generalize on specific village size. But in all of these cases, he found that there were large populations of people living in close proximity to oaks. And in some of the genetic work that he did in this study, he actually began to find that there were genetic relations among oaks that seemed to correlate with kinship uh, ties and trading networks among uh, um, among Native Americans uh, pre-contact. Moving now into a couple of slides that are, have a lot of detail, but one of the things I really want to impress with this upon all of us is that uh, when we think of indigenous landscape management, we often think in fairly uh, relatively simple terms of what that would mean. Yes, we have burning, yes, we have gathering. But some uh, analysis done by a team looking at, at uh, First Nations uh, landscape practices on Vancouver Island began to look at all kinds of ways that Native people used landscape. And uh, what strikes me is the complexity of this relationship of Indigenous people to landscape begins to actually uh, bring it to the level in terms of its complexity and activity and social importance that we would equate with the, the practice of agriculture in general. So ecological strategies, I mean, things that required ecological knowledge, uh, when to burn, how to burn, what to burn, uh, how to create habitat, uh, how to monitor, how to understand the growth cycles of, of, of important, important landscape plants and, and phenology, just the phenomenon of na natural progression. Uh, ideas like transplanting, uh, ways of harvesting that would not damage 
these required very, very sophisticated understandings. This required elder knowledge that was very highly detailed and very technical. In addition, we've got the whole framework, the social framework of, of, of gathering and trading. So we've got the custodial proprietorship, the, the system of tenure in which uh, a, a tribal leader who has uh, who has authority over an area and a group of people basically is able to manage jointly the interests of people and the interests in the environment that sustains them. So monitoring uh, of, of people uh, heading up into the hills to look at the current growth status of, of a, known, a known medicine plant or crop. Uh, ceremony and regulation, the first foods festivals that are so common uh, ceremonial, ceremonially, whether it's first salmon or the first berries, uh, the teamwork and division of labor, all of these things add to a very, very complex social management that managing the landscape requires in order to be a sustainable practice. We also get into technology. I mean, the, the uh, how to improve access to resources uh, through the creation of trails, uh, the establishment of seasonal camps, uh, the use of watercraft to get us to places, the technical innovation. That means, uh, by that I mean, you know, oh, we figured out a, a, a more efficient way of, of gathering berries with combs. Uh, we're, we've designed unique baskets that will allow us to gather and store. And then we've got storage and uh, preservation techniques, rendering food into a form that uh, can overwinter. And ultimately, uh, the complexity really builds on itself with combined strategies of, of involving multiple resources or different processes. Uh, for example, uh, harvesting and then post-harvest burning an area so that, uh, so, so that we know that following burning, uh, we're gonna get a better crop next year. And, and, uh, and, but obviously burning before harvest uh, would, would reduce, uh, reduce the benefit of this ecological service, this food plant or, or uh, that we're managing the landscape for. This is profound to me because it speaks to a complexity that uh, rises uh, uh, to a level of, of what we consider to be scientific uh, landscape management or ecological landscape management. All of this, these systems are, are, are roughly equivalent. And, and we're fortunate now that we are living in a time uh, where indigenous landscape management is gaining uh, uh, its deserved place in the repertoire of ways that we preserve and protect and use landscapes. Uh, one such area, I mean, first of all, let's start with the treaty rights that were reserved by tribes. Let's talk about the affirmation of those tribe, tribal treaty rights in US v. Washington, the Bolt decision. Let's talk about Bolt II, so that we've got a, a, a legal basis for an expanded role of tribes in hunting and fishing and wildlife management. Uh, we go beyond that even to now in 2015, the development of a tribal cultural landscape concept that isn't based on seated or reserved or usual and custom spaces on the landscape, but our uh, tribal cultural landscapes are formed in, in cultural awareness and, and story passed down and cultural memory of landscapes and their associations to groups of people over time. Uh, this uh, has been uh, worked into a framework uh, for consultations that have been uh, occurring under the National Environmental Preservation Act, National Historic Preservation Act, and really uh, opening dialogues uh, well in advance of, of having proposals on the table and, and positions at stake. Uh, the next Opportunity really has just popped up with the uh, Biden administration adopting a memorandum that elevates, quote unquote, elevates indigenous traditional ecological knowledge in federal science and policy processes. So the recognition that elder knowledge, old, old, um, oral histories, uh, traditional 
ecological knowledge, as it's often called, uh, has a rightful place alongside so-called Western or so-called scientific uh, uh, processes and understandings, and, and basically epistemology, the way we know things. So these are tremendous opportunities. This is, a, I think, an exciting time to be looking at ways that we all are able to share these perspectives as we look at landscapes. This is the heavy one. This is where it all goes. Um, uh, Gary Oaks and climate change. Uh, I want you to study for a minute uh, the three images. Pay particular attention to the one on the left and the one on the right. Um, climate change is coming. We understand it. We know it. Uh, I was doing some digging around about a dozen years ago, found in the Canadian forestry literature, uh, the predictions about what climate change would do to the Canadian forest. And uh, we were, all, were already seeing vast and, and really irreversible changes in the interior of BC due to disease, insects, and fire. Uh, the forests are changing. Uh, there are places that have been forests that will no longer be forests. The one thing that, was struck, that struck me in this analysis was uh, a very small mention of the Gary Oak ecosystem. And it predicted that the Gary Oak ecosystem would expand. It makes sense. Uh, it, Gary Oak ecosystem comes from a drier, warmer climate. Uh, why shouldn't it go back to or increase when a drier, warmer climate uh, occurs? Now, this particular piece of analysis, I can't vouch for. I, there wasn't a lot of background to this. But I was struck as it metaphorically uh, can get us into the frame of thinking, OK, what will be the future of Gary Oak forests? And on the, uh, on the right hand panel, you see the areas in gray. Those are areas that Gary Oak ecosystems are predicted through a number of factors uh, to expand and grow. So we know that we're gonna see more Gary Oak in the future if, if we're careful, if we do this the right way. And based on the earlier discussion of the biodiversity values of the Gary Oak ecosystem, we know, for example, that everything that's under stress now in the living world will be under greater stress in a future climate, okay? Things that are not stressed now will become stressed. So if we're thinking about how we can reduce the stress or how we can save stress species, uh, we should be looking at landforms and landscape configurations that foster the most biodiversity, right? Uh, this is where my thinking is going. So if we know that Gary Oak ecosystems provide maximum biodiversity when they're developed and matured and they're sustained. Uh, and we know that Gary Oak ecosystems are going to expand in the future. Why not start now? And maybe that's the point of, uh, of these projects throughout our region in the long run. Maybe that's the principal benefit of these projects is by planting 3000 oaks in SQUIM, and creating uh, an entire new generation of, of trees in that population and expanding the footprint of that population. Perhaps what we're doing is preserving the means of biodiversity for 40 or 50 years from now. Maybe the oak, the oak ecosystem plantations that are going in the ground now mostly out of local pride and local interests and curiosity. And maybe those are the arcs that are gonna transport uh, the Gary Oak ecosystem into a new era of its ecological opportunity uh, that comes uh, with uh, a warming trend in climate. So that's, that's a framework that I'm speculating in that I, I wanna offer as a way of thinking about this kind of work. 
And it doesn't, it's not limited to Gary Oaks. Any restoration work we're doing that uh, improves habitat, that expands the footprint of habitat uh, and, and slows the steady progression of degradation of habitat, uh, any of that restoration work that we do is going to uh, be an important bridge to future populations of uh, people, future populations of birds, future populations of mammals, and uh, the future landscapes uh, that are important to us. There are some resources. Uh, I'm not going to provide specific citations for these, uh, but these are PDFs uh, uh, that are available. And uh, I guess my, my principal uh, advice would be simply to Google Gary Oak restoration and you're going to find the same things that I found. Uh, the publication in the center is uh, 500 some pages long and it really represents state of the art uh, thinking uh, coming to us from uh, Vancouver Island. Um, I have to acknowledge people who over the years I've worked with uh, who have been really important to this work and who have inspired me and kept me going through it. Finally, what I'd like to do is uh, just share a vision. Um, as I've mentioned, I hit this stuff in about 20 year spurts, uh, being curious and studying them, uh, taking action, doing something about it. And now 20 or 19 years later, I've been able to look at the, the, the product of, of all that effort and the work of so many people. Um, this is a vision uh, looking across uh, the, Oak, the Oak Project and SQUIM as it is today. And this is 20 years from now. Thank you.